for match number two. And, you know, don't worry, Language Hacker fans, I'm sure he's going to be back uh, later and with a vengeance because I, I do think that uh, eventually, uh, you know, players will lose. I don't think it's possible for everyone to go undefeated. Uh, it's just not mathematically uh, possible here. So uh, some of your favorite players will end up taking loss. Speaking of which, uh, you know, some of the new kids on the block. Can Empanizado perhaps in spirit follow up and perhaps deliver a win not just for himself but also for the newcomers considering that pop jason is winless uh, we're gonna start things off with warrior being left up for empanizado unusual choice last week but this week with people bringing priest seems a lot more likely so with that tj what do you think uh, about the leave warrior <laughs> up strategy uh i don't like it I think Warrior's going to get a win very consistently, no matter which way you slice it. Sure, Priest is one of the better decks against it, but with just... You, you said it earlier. You, it's the same as Demon Hunter. Warrior can do these crazy combos where if they're given enough time, they could piece together the massive Corcoran Elites. They also have additional charge damage in the form of Gromish Hellscream, which has made its way into the list over the past couple weeks. So their damage from hand is just ridiculous. And you do need to find the right tools quickly uh, as the Galakron Priest uh, to make sure that you're, you're not getting run over. If you take chip damage in the early game and you don't have a significant way to gain it back, you're going to die. And that's been you know kind of proven over and over again where Warrior is pretty still struggling against Warrior for the players that are leaving it up, even though it's, it's you know kind of a, a reasonable strategy on paper. I still think it's risky. Yeah. But honestly, if you look at the other side of it, Demon Hunter is almost the same way. Uh, we're, we're seeing Demon Hunters actually have a decent time against Priest as well. So uh, it's kind of a, you know, what do you think is better? I just think that his other decks might have a better time against Demon Hunter than they would against Warrior. And that's why uh, I disagree with leaving it up. But uh, I'm not the Grandmaster here. Eddie is. So we'll see if he'll be able to capitalize on that. Yeah, I was struggling a lot specifically in this matchup. I messaged uh, the person that I always message when I am lost uh, in Hearthstone, maybe in life too a little bit. I messaged Hunter Race. I said, Casper, how do you beat Priest as Warrior? And Hunter Ace said, Battle Rage. <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> you, you know, Dan. I don't know if I'd put your faith in an O2 Grandmaster right Oof. now. <laughs> That's right. What a world it would be if uh, Hunter Ace got relegated. I think. Oh, uh, geez. I, I, I don't know. I feel like I would, my entire understanding of uh, what's good and bad would completely flip upside down. But perhaps uh, that's another storyline to pay attention to a different region for now. You know, take a look at. Uh, Eddie's lineup, I think one thing to, to note is that once more, Eddie choosing to, you know, have a little bit of splash with his own take on things. You take a look at uh, some of his decks. Uh, the Warrior, for example, is starting to move a little bit away from those egg packages. You see, like, Serpent Egg in a lot of those deck lists. Instead, we just start to play, you know, Deathwing Mad Aspect instead. It just seems like we're going further away from having those egg big plays with Terry and Gorefeed instead of uh, playing proactively. I think the first person that I saw uh, advocating this a lot was Meaty. He's a uh, regular in the top 10 legend, even pushing top one very often. And also is uh, one of the vanguards fighting on the front of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, thank you to all the nurses and doctors out there who are always fighting every day. What a guy, by the way, you know, like legend both in and out of the game fighting. Uh, in real life and also fighting in the tavern. Anyways, uh, you know, Eddie kind of splashing in some of those new modern texts. Uh, meanwhile, we see Empanizado living a little bit in the past with the Serpent Egg and the Tyrant Gorfiend. So what's going to happen? Is it the, the Old Faithful, the egg packages that's going to reign supreme here for Empanizado? Or perhaps will we see uh, Eddie be able to overcome it with some of the new and latest cutting-edge deck technologies? Also worth noting, by the way, six different classes is going to be featured this series, which is uh, something you love to see in a series of Hearthstone. And some we haven't seen very often the past couple weeks. Um, yeah, then the, the egg versus non-egg choice is very divisive. Uh, it's, 
It's not a, agreed upon by any stretch of the imagination by some of the high-level pros. Um, but Casey even tweeted out uh, the other day after seeing the submissions that uh, seeing people submit Druid for GM that don't play Blackjack Center and Rogue and no sidekicks in Demon Hunter or even still playing non-egg in Rage Warrior, please just make it look like you play the game. So he feels very strongly that eggs are the right way to go. So uh, there's still a lot of high level Damn. pros that are, that, you know, disagree with uh, some of the, the new texts uh, in the deck. And honestly, Dan, I don't even know which side I lean on. Uh, I've played with both of them. I've had the same amount of success with both of them. Yeah. The deck is insanely powerful. No matter which cards you put in those slots, Victory. as long as you have the package of Risky Skipper, Battle Rage, Blood Boil Brute. It's just, you know, which one do you think will give you the most percentage points in some matchups? Egg does give you that board presence early on in the game, whereas the Deathwing Man aspect uh, brings some unwinnable situations into winnable situations. Um, but uh, I still think that Terran can sometimes be a very awkward card to use. And that's why I maybe 51% lean towards the uh, meaty version of the deck uh, just for the time being. But again, as with most things... I've said it multiple times over the past couple weeks. Even with Charge Zoo, I am willing to be proven wrong. And maybe M. Auto will be able to do just that. All right. Well, that being said, let's go into game one between M. Auto and Eddie. Um, the Priest it versus the Warrior is exactly what Eddie wants on paper. Yeah, Priest on paper. is very solid uh, against the big boards of Warrior highlighted by uh, the fact that, you know, if your opponent leaves up a really big board, board, Soul Mirror can end up answering a lot of those big combos. But that's where I feel like some of the more modern techs are beneficial. Because when you start playing things like Captain Greenskin and Deathwing, um, you, you end up having more proactive threats or even just more damage from the hand. right? Like Captain Greenskin, for example adds a lot more weapon damage that Priest has a harder time stopping if they don't have weapon removal on their deck. Uh, the Grom Hellscream, which has largely been standardized across most decks, but that's just, again, more burst for the Priest to have to handle. So, you, know, you have to really consider that uh, all of these things for Priest, they have to make sure to not only, of course, have a sturdy board, but also react to the big burst of their opponent. Yeah, it's a difficult task, a very difficult task. And I just looked up the data real quick, and um, with pretty large sample sizes um, in Legend rank, uh, there's not enough in Top 1000 Legend, but in Legend rank, just the inclusion of Grom Hellscream gives you 10 percentage points in the matchup against Galakron Priest. It's still, like we said, unfavored on paper, but just that card uh, gives you 10 percentage points against Priest. That's a really big deal when you can change out one card and make the matchup that much closer. And that's why we're seeing players that bring Priest that weren't banning Warrior in the past actually ban Warrior this week and leave up something else because uh, Warrior is just so much stronger against all the other decks and it's gotten closer against Priest. So, and Bunny's out is kind of playing the, you know, whatever, uh, the egg, but also uh, with Grom. So, We'll see how it's going to fare against Priest. Right now, he's... I don't want to say after a slow start, because, you know, oftentimes Warrior just doesn't do anything until turn three, where, like, War Maul Challenger or a weapon comes down. Um, but still, Eddie has the, the board early on in the game, and Panisado has to kind of try and uh, piece together what he thinks his best course of action is. And playing a 3-3 Live War Lance can't really go wrong with that. Yeah, Live War Lance... Very useful just to bring utility to the warrior deck. You know, at first I was a big proponent of playing the bombs, which um, incidentally the bombs might actually be much better versus priest and could be one of those ways warrior fights back if you're trying to adapt to a priest on the ladder. That being said, I've really come around to live wire lance, just kind of seeing the utility that all the lackeys bring, whether it's um, getting a spell off the your lackey, whether it's you know, be able to taunt up certain things and give it extra health so that way with the Titanic Lackey so you can have better battle rages and risky skipper turns. 
even just discovering a dragon sometimes has been very useful for me. So it feels like this live wire lance is really core right now to how this warrior wants to operate. Not to mention, of course, that it's a cheap activator for things like Risky Skipper in pinch scenarios. Yeah. It's the X Factor. The X Factor. Red Caliber also, you can't play it the turn after you play Corsair Cash in most situations if you're playing it on curve. True. Just feel, it feels bad. Swids is still doing it, though, to a mild amount of success. Granted, his warrior's getting banned a lot, but... Yeah. I just want, I want people to Corsair Cash like Gore Howl. Just <laughs> swing for what? 16 damage in two turns? Eh, Fibonacci will do it. I and mean, that sounds bad, but it sounds funny. Yeah. Alright. But he's out of finding creative use of this bomb wrangler, not wanting to part ways with a risky skipper. Yeah, he needs uh, to find on. some way to start actually threatening the board. If he just played bomb wrangler, one that's vulnerable to very easy removal from Eddie, or even getting uh, hard punished if Eddie had Shadow Madness in the hand. I must but uh, the second thing is Eddie, starting from turn 5 onwards, actually has meaningful development. You know, everything up leading up to turn 5, you know, it's more removal, reactive based plays. But now he has like two shielded Galakrons, he's got uh, Mr. Sticky Finger, I <laughs> steal the weapon, which um, has got to be tempting if you're Eddie, just because it removes your opponent's ability to tempo in a several ways. But there's also a lot of upside if you're able to steal another weapon later on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny, Dan. What Priest can do sometimes. Toxic. DJ. Steals a weapon with a card that he got from a stolen card. Right. Just as a, a fun little callback to what we were saying before. Priest did something to counterplay me. Ah. <sighs> so toxic. So toxic. <laughs> yeah, this is what we're talking about, too. Empanizado, I mean, as much as it stinks to have that weapon be destroyed and stolen, he had Corsair ca cash number two, and he also had Anchor, so he has plenty more. Uh, weapons to play. In fact, Anchor helps him set up huge plays later on when he's guaranteed to have uh, risky skippers in hand and he's got all these small little cheap cards pulled out of the deck. The Anchor risky skipper, skipper package has become so fundamental and core to what Warrior wants to be doing that if you get a chance to safely play Anchor, you should m play it most of the time. Mm -hmm. There's there's very Even, few like universal gener generalities in Hearthstone where like you should always be doing X, um, mm. but uh, Anchor is pretty close to one of them in terms of what Warrior wants to play. Yeah, I mean, look at just what he did that turn. He had the option to play Corsair Cash and play a buff Livewire land, right? Uh, but instead, went for Anchor, knowing that. By playing that, not playing Corsair Cash, and pulling cards out of his deck, he is more likely to draw the Livewire Lance without being buffed, but he's willing to risk that all just to get the Pirates out of his deck as quick as he can. That's right. Can't make an omelet without scrambling a few eggs, TJ. What now? Very relevant in this situation. Oh, yeah. Pretty sure this egg's about to get... Incredibly scrambled. Mm. Delicious. I love breakfast food. I love food. We what have so much in common. Um, <laughs> Empanizado has a Risky Skipper opportunity here. If he plays Risky Skipper and, say, Sky Raider, uh, there'll be five damage minions on the board. Blood Bill Brute will cost two. That gives him two more mana to be able to play cards like Ramp. Um, and potentially even push damage. The only issue that I see is that he doesn't get a clean kill through the shield of Galakron. Oh, wow. Using Whirlwind in this position. Interesting. I actually like this. Okay. Uh, for the reasons we talked about before the match took place, um, using the Rampage in this situation, 
just to kind of push three immediate damage with the egg through and using like a risky skipper without battle rage. His game plan here is just to put on some chip damage and then end the game with big combos. Okay. Uh, it, and I, th I think that this is wise to kind of hold on to things. Now, you can get trapped into a situation where you spend the whole game waiting for your combos and you're not doing anything proactive. And so you're not pushing that chip damage and you're giving Priest uh, a, the opportunity to build the board. Uh, but I don't think his hand is to the point yet where he needs to say, all right, I'm abandoning the combo plan. I don't have the card draw I need. Uh, I don't have anything proactive to play on the board. He's still got many plays and many opportunities to draw Battle Rage. Like even next turn, Corsair Cash, equip a weapon, start getting value out of some lackeys. And then as soon as he draws that Battle Rage, boom, Risky Skipper, look for the combo pieces, end the game. I think that's the uh, the overall strategy here from, from Impanizado. So yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with this play, but still got to see if it works out because Eddie's got a lot of stuff. A lot yeah. of stuff to put away. What I'm concerned about, and you know, I, I think you did a great job breaking down the benefits of Empanizado's play here, is just that I feel like it's really slow, and that's at the pace that Priest wants you to play at. Um, that's the only sure. concern. You know, if Empanizado, he does have other ways to really like press in here. You could rampage and then blitz for mercenary, but it's kind of like what we're talking about. You know, does Empanizado take it slow and save these combo pieces for his inevitable core kind of elite comp? If so, it's in his best interest to. Continue to play slow. You know, Corsair Cash into that second live wire lands. Start attacking, get more lackeys, develop onto the board a little bit proactively. I can see this uh, really going up in Azato's way if Eddie is not able to set up the appropriate defenses. But Eddie does have some of his best cards in his hand right now. This live wire lands is not trivial damage whatsoever. It's nine damage represented in the hand. Yeah. Hmm. Someone's gotta lead if Emrazada takes too long to get set up to <laughs> the cobalt yes. sticky finger, just can't get rid of this guy. Yeah, and I had criticisms about Empanizado in and one of the Swiss matches that he played, where he didn't pay attention to direwolf positioning with a faceless Ooh. lackey. But he's improved, Dan. That's what you love to see. Love to see it. You love to see it. And again. Not a trivial amount of damage. Right now, there's just six damage staring at Eddie. If he doesn't put something in the way, it doesn't even matter if F is out of combo. He's just going to get chipped out of the game. Wow. Very slow play. Second Rampage, still no Chargers. So, yeah, one, Eddie is probably respecting optimal burst breakpoints. Starting from turn seven onwards, the opponent does have the ability to play the Core Carnal Elite plus the Inner Rage and utilize the Bloodsword and Mercenary, and that's 12 damage. So uh, Eddie at 17 felt a little bit on the edge of that, and he might need that health later on. Also, by playing like one minion, he might like reduce, like it, it makes it harder for, uh, it makes it harder for Empanizado to get even better Blood Bro Brute situation setups. This is cool. Yes. I think one I battle rate or one battle rate, one rampage. Yeah, I agree. Uh, would be great here. Both rampages. Hey. Okay. He's going in. And if the core currently gets drawn, Nepotizado still has a lethal setup here, so this looks fine to me on paper. Yeah. 
And this is a very annoying board to remove because he keeps the serpent egg uh, yes. intact, yes. which means that Eddie doesn't have an easy time. This board isn't the greatest for Soul Mirror because it's really only taking four power off the board. It would have to be Soul Mirror plus something. And the only thing that Eddie has to combo with it right now uh, is a penance. Um, Those have wild pyromancer opportunities here. I'm yeah, that consider. still leaves Empanizado with the 3 4. And if he goes for wild pyromancer plus soul mirror, uh, all Empanizado needs is a, a single damage source outside of uh, Goblin Lackey. Whether it's Kobold Lackey or Korkun Elite or Grom or Inner Rage. It's like Breath of the Infinite. Uh, he does have a dragon in hand. Okay, so heals up, but still leaves. Power on board. There's an inner rage. That's eight. Oh, that's battle rage. Excuse me. Point still stands. Empanizado can draw for lethal. Hmm. He's gonna swing first. Sees a cobalt lackey. Ooh. The magic number is now cut down to three. If he he has four mana dedicated to a core kind of lead in case he draws it, he can't swing with another weapon. Not that he has one anyways in his deck. So, you know, there's actually surprisingly few amount of lethal outs besides a Quark on late here. Because Grom's too expensive. Yeah. Uh, Bomb Wrangler lethal? Sure. Doesn't have enough time, it feels. Yeah, and you know, he's gonna he go get for it. There's a high, there's a chance that it does actually end up getting there, and he oh, finds he it. <laughs> wow, had another bomb as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, chances are Empanizado was gonna be able to close out that game, and exactly what we were talking about, TJ, where yeah. just take it a little bit slower. And Priest still kind of struggles a little bit against some of those late game scenarios. And good on Empanizado to be able to figure out uh, like a two or three turn line in order to pressure his opponent enough to get them in a position to, you know, potentially get lucky to win, right? Because he could have also just drawn straight up Core Elite to win that game. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, overall, uh, the point still stands that is Priest actually still good enough to bring? Its best matchup is supposed to be Warrior, and it still didn't even get that win, despite Eddie queuing up, anticipating it. I don't know. There's a lot of questions. Yeah, it just doesn't seem... I don't know. It just doesn't seem worth it. Uh, the Galakron Priest um, in Legend, not Top 1000 Legend, uh, with Grom, so very close to this exact first sprint bonus auto, has a 45% win rate uh, against Galakron Priest, and I expect that uh, Grandmasters are on average slightly better uh, than the average Legend player. So you could even move that close to 50%, maybe even over 50%. Um, it just, I don't know. Eh, it, there's two questions there. One, is it worth it bringing Priest? Uh, two, if you're bringing Priest, is Warrior the deck that you're going to leave up and, and you know try and not target, but try and sneak some wins off of? It just doesn't seem like that's a reasonable strategy. And, uh, you know, it's not even like Empanizado had the, the craziest draw in the world. It just seems like an average warrior draw. So uh, no battle rages until turn 12 or turn 11. Um, but time will tell, I suppose. There's going to be some hits uh, to the deck in the near future. But right now in this metagame that we're experiencing, I'm, I just can't buy into it yet, Dan. Can't buy into it. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree just for now. but. Uh... I'm willing to stand corrected later if that ends up happening um, and Priest ends up becoming the thing. There is some belief that perhaps slower decks like Priest will uh, have a better chance 
once the balance patch goes through, because then all of those other aggressive strategies will take a hit. In the meantime, we're going to take a brief intermission as we get ready for game number two between Empanizado and Eddie, so stay tuned. More Hearthstone Grandmasters for the Americas region will continue right after this. Hearthstone Grandmasters is brought to you by T-Mobile. Rank up with America's largest 5G network. Switch to T-Mobile today. Would rather have seven fingers on each hand or seven toes on each foot? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh god, this is difficult. I'm very bad at uh, games that require you to have a lot of uh, keyboard mechanics. And uh, seven fingers might help me a lot with uh, that. And that could be cool. Yeah, that's, that's just more joints for you to have pain in. <laughs> Well, it was my answer, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven fingers on each hand. Seven toes sounds like difficult to walk with. Seven toes on each foot. I just put on a sock. Seven fingers, because otherwise it would be hard to buy some shoes. I would rather have uh, seven fingers on my hand. Uh, I use hands a lot. Seven toes on each foot, because seven fingers doesn't seem practical and it's going to get in your way more. Seven toes, you can just deal with that. It doesn't really seem like it's going to cause any trouble. Shoes wouldn't fit. I could just get them custom made. they will be fine. <laughs> yeah. I would rather have seven toes on each foot because nobody could see my feet if I'm wearing socks anyways. And I, I, I could live with that. I'll be great at football. More area of like hitting the ball. Welcome back, everyone, to Hearthstone Grandmasters, brought to you by America's largest 5G network, T-Mobile. Coming up next, we got game number two between Empanizado and Eddie. After that, uh, game number one, where Warrior was left up by Eddie. He says, you know what? I'm going to use Priest against it. I anticipate first Q Warrior. I'm ready. And last week, we saw Warrior almost on permaban status by every single player. And this week, we lit through and well see what happens the class designed to counter tj did not do that you're never ready dan never ready nobody's ever ready <laughs> to beat warrior consistently with anything um but alas it's got to win no he's talking about it anymore 
See if Eddie can uh, find some wins with his other decks. Uh, and Buddy Zato's remaining decks. He's got the Face Hunter as well as the Zoo Warlock. The Charge Zoo Warlock where he cut one Wolf Rider. But he still has two Stone Tusk Warriors and two Blue Go Warriors. So we'll see, Dan. We'll see. Yes, we really shall. And uh, Empanizado is going to go to his Zoo Warlock for game number two. Zoo Warlock has been under the microscope here at Grandmasters, largely because of that Wolf Rider Blue Go Warrior Stone Tusk Boar package. In the classic slash basic set of Hearthstone, when you, when you log into Hearthstone for the first time ever, you are given uh, you know, an entire suite of free cards. And these free cards, while a few of them can be pretty effective in decks, they're supposed to help get you introduced to the game. They're simple, they're not super high power level. The idea is as you progress through the game, you're collecting more cards and building um, your collection to have a versatile set of tools if you want to play aggressive or defensive or somewhere. And so when people look at cards like Stone Toast Boar and Blue Gill Warrior and Wolf Rider, these are cards that people long ago, since 2013 when Hearthstone first went into beta, people like have ignored and said those are like options that you can get off of Discovers, right? If it says add a random two cost minion to your hand or whatever. But we don't, we're not supposed to put these cards purposely in our deck and yet Zoo has found a way to put all of these charge minions. I'm waiting for the Reckless Rocketeer, TJ, to make its way to the <laughs> We'll see about that. <laughs> Just we type charge. This put the Stormwind Knight. At one charge minion at every mana slot. Team. Let's find a way. All right. Look at it. Look at what these cards... There's one word of text on each of these cards, TJ. Tar charge. Charge. And I think Saddle, or I can't remember who brought this point up. Maybe it was our producer, Abar, but how convoluted card text has gotten. Not even and card how, text on one of those cards. And how, and how fancy the names of certain things are. Oh, yeah. Like, Stone Tusk Boar, Wolf Rider, and Shield Bear are just literal. Right. Shield Bear, he's bearing a shield. Stone Tusk Boar, that's literally what the animal is called. And then a Wolf Rider. It's a guy riding a wolf. All those card names are literal. They're just basic cards. Yeah. Compare that to like the Nightshade Matron. The Sethic a Veil Weaver. A Glaive Bound Adept. Crimson yeah. Sigil Runner. Like, in a way, it's therapeutic to just see simplicity. Just simple cards, basic set, simple words, charge. You can attack anything. As long as there's no taunt in the way. Taunt. Easy. You know, uh, and this is a really powerful early game here from the Demon Hunter with uh, the Battle Mage and the Battle Fiend. You know, actually, I mean, if you look at it, the, the set that launched Demon Hunter, Ashes of Outland, does have relatively oh, simplistic hard Battle Fiend. One of them. You can see a couple of them in the hand. Well, it's Eddie. Blazing Battle Mage, Dan. It's not just Battle Mage. Yeah, because this Battle Mage is lit. Battle Mage. <laughs> yeah. One mana 2-2. Two, two. That's lit. Yeah. You got to play Blazing Battle Mage on April 20th. That's just what you do. That's what you do. It's not going to stop there from Eddie. Does have uh, maybe a, a dead-ish turn next turn. But yeah. Oof. that soul fire hurts a lot for him. He does not want to have to sacrifice that. And Demon Hunter is now at that position where <laughs> they get to leverage their board, pick off value trades. Empanizado is behind. And the Stone Tusk Boar looks like it's just going to trade into a minion here. Unless. I mean, I shared Matron can answer most of the board if Eddie chooses to trade into it. That might be a ticket out of here. Otherwise, Empanizado is 
Well, one, either going to float mana or life tap, put himself in a position where he can still, he can actually get bullied further. Right now, it just seems like his out is Hand of Gul'dan, and if he ditches the Nightshade Matron, uh, it means that he ditches both of his sources of uh, Hand of Gul'dan activators. Uh, expired Merchant at least puts more Nightshade Matrons back into his hand, so he still has that option to be built on next turn. Oof. Yeah, but Dan. this, I don't know, this makes it but feel Dan. so far behind. Like, the, the, the idea is that, yes, Empanizada will be able to respawn to his opponent's plays. Okay, he picks up a one-mana minion. Chances are he does. The deck does contain a bunch of one-mana minions. But, you know, is he going to just be too far behind in the life total? You know, Zoo isn't a winning deck if you're just soul firing. You could have just stopped there, Dan. And major <laughs> I could have just stopped there. Zoo isn't a winning deck. <laughs> The end. But when it does win, <laughs> it doesn't win by being reactive like this. It wins by using the Nightshade Matron to trade and then push damage. Mm -hmm. Right now, all Empezado did was trade mm -hmm. and then hope this 1-1 one -one sticks on the board, which uh, we know it's it's unlikely that Eddie lets this board survive. He does have this opportunity for Warglaze of Azanoth. He did pick up a Seder Overseer, which does give him another potential play here. You can Seder Overseer, I beam costs only one mana, then Hero Power. Both are viable line because he gets to develop the Seder Overseer. Oh, he gets to goodness. use the work as Azoth the following turn and capitalize on all these two twos. And then the best part is, even after Eddie's done dumping his hand, he's got a skull of Gul'dan. We're with you. Seems like a winning recipe to me, Dan. Oh yeah. We needed the hand of Gul'dan there. Uh, which, as a matter of fact, is holding the skull of Gul'dan. That's right. Skull in the hand skull. is worth two in the bush, TJ. <laughs> That's what they say. That's what Grandpa Sanders always used to tell me. <laughs> you shall not pass. Useful things eager to share. Wow, what a, what a weak turn for Empanizado, and uh, Eddie is going to steamroll his way. And that's going to do it. Empanizado concedes. Team number two over to the Tempo Demon Hunter. And, you know, the questions for Zoo, can you, at least on our end, obviously, there's still opportunities for that Zoo to win, but if Demon Hunter is going to go out to a fast curve and you're stuck soul firing in response, uh, that's a losing position for the zoo to be in. Uh, and Demon Hunter, 2 0 for today. Priest, 0 2 for today. Warrior, 1 0 for today so far. So, in terms of the win rates so far this week in America, is obviously extremely low sample size, but uh, it is our job, as in we get paid to draw up storylines from this. You know, Demon Hunter and. Warriors still look like they are ban worthy status, and you can see on both sides being reflected in that. Empanizado did ban that warrior, and he did ban that Tempo Demon Hunter. You can see exactly why that. Is. Yeah, we get paid to blow things way out of proportion. Oh yeah, be completely results oriented. Our thinking in our thinking, and make players look as good or as bad as we choose. That's right. They're even Incredible. starting to turn some of the Grandmaster's reactions on camera into the thumbnail clickbait, DJ. Oh, YouTube. yeah. Gallon looked like, uh, you know, Gallon looked like he is, you know, very much enjoying what is happening in a game of Hearthstone when I believe, you know, it, it was, what, what was the exact game that it was showing his reaction to? Do you know? But he had this, like, giant remember. thumbnail of him, just, like, wide mouth, like, stretching his eyes, looking like he's going completely nuts. Maybe it was fake. I don't know. Was it fake? I thought it was real. No, it is. Go to <laughs> YouTube.com slash Arsenal Esports. And it's top five moments Grandmasters 2020 season. And it's like, it looks like uh, Gallon is either uh, reacting to a Hearthstone play or he is saying a prayer out to some kind of deity. You see, it is, it is crazy going on over there. Anyways, uh, going to game number three, we have the Zoo Warlock versus the Rogue coming up here, and we have 
Uh, Rogue that's been entering the week struggling. So why people bring Rogue here even going into week number five? It's just a consistent deck. Uh, it doesn't have too many terrible matchups, but it also doesn't have too many fantastic matchups. And in Conquest, sometimes that get that just gets the job done. Especially if you're not trying to corner something specific. If you're just trying to bring, uh, you know, overall, like the on average uh, best lineup, a rogue kind of fits in there. It has a lot of uh, hands that are just like almost automatic wins, like Edwin Van Cleef with a lot of cheap stuff to play with it. And it's got a lot of flexibility in its game plan. Uh, and, you know, that's a deck that a lot of players cling to uh, because they feel like they have uh, agency. But that comes at the cost of uh, just being able to beat certain things consistently. Bamboozle. Yeah, and it's not just the bamboozle. It's the fact that Eddie didn't have a secret in hand for the Shadow Jewel Hanar. Hanar, of course, another card that's being targeted by the upcoming balance patch that was announced earlier today, which Ooh. we'll talk about more. But look at that. The Trade Rider. He wouldn't have even needed that in however much time the patch would take to come out because it would have been answered by the Blue Girl Warrior. But Wolf Rider is the only way he can answer the scenario right now. It's just, do you call his bluff? So many possibilities. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, how many cards did Eddie keep in his opening hand? This is something that, you know, if you're trying to level up your play from a beginner intermediate level, really try to take a, an opportunity to recognize how many uh, cards your opponent has. And if it's not, uh, in, in cards like Shadow to Hanar, if they're not keeping um, a lot of cards, and chances are they don't actually have that secret. They would have to have drawn it off the top of their deck. Doubly so if it's a Highlander Rogue. That being said, Eddie is playing just the straight up secret package, not a Highlander version. So there are multiple copies of it, and now we get to see potentially a really big punish. This last mana could go to redemption for Eddie. And that would keep his Shadow Jewel Hanar alive because he's anticipating up in his out to be able to trade into it. Well, even better, Dan. He has a bamboozle up. <laughs> so if he trades in the Shadow Jewel Hanar, he gets a much bigger minion right. that can then also be resurrected by redemption. Ooh. And that's even if Bunnizada wants to take the risk to trade into this, considering if it's a you know a reasonable sized minion. Uh, we're talking about a five drop here for Shadow Jeweler Hanar. He may not even be able to kill it because he doesn't have much power with the one drops in his hand. Uh, Woodwalker Shield Bear, that's only three power, uh, even with the Magic Carpet buff. So this is a tough situation. He has he can start by playing a minion first to rule out ambush. Ambush is the most likely. Eddie plays two ambush, one bamboozle, one dirty tricks. Um. And even Ambush, he doesn't have a great way to deal with that either. Because he'd have to trade both of his one drops in. Because he wanted to protect his magic carpet in this situation. In most instances. It boozled! Oh! Oh, oh my gosh, that is a huge yikes. Starving Buzzard. A relic at this point in Hearthstone. At five mana, way too expensive. You shall not and that is a unfortunate outcome, to say the least, for Eddie, who's invested a lot of his tempo and his line to play. Oh, although he does find Blackjack, stunner number two, another card that's being targeted by 17.2.1. Blackjack stunner will now only make cards cost one more instead of two. However, for now, still gets this full effect. That's uh, it's not irrelevant. Not at all. It's pack tactics as well. Pack tactics kind of helps Eddie get some board presence because the most important thing that he's looking at right now is how he's going to get faces corrupted down on five. That pack tactics. Pack tactics. Most likely going to allow him to stick it. But his auto still, I mean, it looks very similar to last game. 
where he's got charge minions and things that discard other things. You just he discards bird. magic carpet here. Then yeah. uh, put two magic carpets. Oh no, it's not expired merchant. The door well, that's you. annoying. Losing magic carpet is fairly impactful given that Pizzato, majority of his deck is one mana below. Or not one mana. Yeah. Uh, his majority is one mana. Still, and again, just like last game, Empanizado is going to rely on Hand of Potem draw, which he didn't even find last time. Yeah. As it turns out, you are a deck that's really dependent on one card to draw cards. Uh, the win rate when you get that card is a lot higher, but. Ooh! Uh, and he got it. Oh my goodness. Nice. Kind of amazing. <laughs> the uh, classic Eddie quick hand flip. Yeah, Eddie is uh, surprisingly a very expressive player um, at you know at random intervals for me because like sometimes it feels like he's not reacting whatsoever. I'm like, wait, that was like a really impactful moment. Like, why aren't you reacting? And then other times, like he, it feels like he made like the best possible play, and he's like shaking his head, like flipping his hand, like wait, what, what what went wrong? What happened? <laughs> and uh, you know, I kind of want to. I, I did briefly like talk to Eddie. Uh, at the GM summit, but that was one thing that I forgot to ask him. So next time I'm gonna actually, him, I should probably inquire as to uh, why why that is. Just I'm pretty sure he just thinks like so many steps ahead. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Like he's like, oh no, I messed something up down the th the third turn from now. Uh, yeah, and that's only if my opponent specifically draws this, and I and I end up committing to this line. So many Which, options. if that is the case, that is very, uh, well, impressive to see, you know, someone who can map out such a future in the game when it feels like there's a lot of divergent paths. Are you going to go for this Faces Corruptor set that we are talking about? Uh, in his best interest to take out the Fiendish Servant as well as the Expired Merchant. Just to make sure that attack buff doesn't go anywhere. Knows that it's likely that Empanizado has some opportunity to capitalize on Hand of Gul'dan. But Empanizado doesn't actually have a way to do it. And also these Blue Good Warrior and Wolf Riders just once more feel not impactful. I wonder. Does he have to hard cast Hand of Gul'dan here? He can try and bail himself out with second expired merchant or second diamond shade matron with a tap. But there's only one left of each. Oh no! Oh jeez, is he <laughs> trading with both of these? Ugh! Oh, it's disgusting. I can't, I can't, and can't watch. Yeah, this is brutal. Seems. The Brotherhood shall come. Like Zeus just not really connecting the right half of their yeah. deck. And I mean, Empezal's got pieces of it, right? He's got. He had the hand of Gul'dan discard. He had like a magic. Oh, scrap it. Yeah, he had, he had all the stuff, and it doesn't seem like he's piecing it together. Oh. I mean, Eddie can even just tank one over two turns with this Blazing Battle Mage because he knows that. And Panizato's hand is two hand of Gul'dan's. And if Panizato has a hard cast this, Eddie picked up a Dirty Tricks last turn, which was a sneaky, incredible draw because he was running out of resources. And it's very likely, considering Panizato doesn't have many... Uh, well, I guess he has Soul Fires as well. Uh, if you drew, like, Soul Fire, he could uh, dump one of these, but uh, knows that Two of those would proc Dirty Tricks as well with the Soul Fires, and if he had to Hand of Gul'dan, it would also proc it. Hard cast it. Right, which uh, if Gano, Hand of Gul'dan said six mana, draw three cards, your opponent draws two cards, I think it'd be a lot worse to make you reconsider if you want to cast it from the hand. 
now Eddie ready to actually be able ride? to capitalize. Ready to ride. He's ready to capitalize on like what Rogue usually does best, which is sticking a minion on board and staying ahead. Yeah. I, I honestly don't want to play Faces Lackey here. I don't think it's necessary. And if you get Doomsayer, I don't it's a small, small, small percentage chance that you get Doomsayer. But how do you lose the game? Even if you don't play it. I think it's more likely that you, you lose this game by getting a Doomsayer for Faces Lackey than you you lose this game by not playing it. Just taunt something up. Hit him a couple times. Dagger up. Uh-oh. It's right. really unlikely, TJ. Okay, but what's more unlikely? Okay, that's the question. The doomsayer. That's that's what's unlikely. No, no. What's more? What's more unlikely? He lo he loses his game from doomsayer, or he loses his game because he didn't play faces lackey. I think it's more likely that he loses the game by getting doomsayer. It's, okay, so you're saying is. he gave himself a slight. Percent, he lost a few percentage points. Not even a few. He lost yes. like half of a percentage point. Yes. By making that play. How could yes. you, Eddie? How dare you? Call yourself a grandmaster? Yeah. Well, I mean, at you're this like point, you're like 99.9% like that... <laughs> to win, and now you're 99.89% to win? Unacceptable. I, I do see what you're saying. It does seem at this point like that's what I could talk about with that turn. Yeah, it does seem unnecessary. The the, the reason why I like it, straight up, is because it introduces two turn lethal. Um, yeah, two turn lethal without the faces like Yeah. As long as long as there were no taunts or removal, even with a taunt, and also he would have had to trade in minions because his board was full, so his like maximum potential damage was limited by the fact that he played the Faces Lackey. So, because he had 14 he damage on board without the Lackey and the, the bone, really? bone guy. I thought he had, uh, yes. I thought he had uh, 13. Uh, he had 9, 10, 11, 12. Oh, no, you're right. He did have 13. Okay, well, fair point, Dan. <laughs> Still think. Not worth it. But at this point, it doesn't matter. None of it matters, Dan. Wow. You having an ex existential crisis on broadcast right now, TJ? <laughs> yeah. You win. Yep. This time. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for game number three. And Zoo struggles continues, TJ. That is a zero and two record for this series. Now, Bloodface did get the win. Um, He's not playing the full charge zoo, though. He isn't playing the full charge zoo, and he also one. He uh, didn't. He also had the scrap imps on curve. Mm -hmm. So you know, two entirely different worlds. Maybe that's like a knock against zoo, though, right? Like, how draw dependent is this deck if it can't win? If it doesn't have scrap it, it drew like every other piece, right? It drew like, you know, the magic carpet with a bunch of cheap stuff. It drew hand of gold Dan that you can synergize with. And yeah, it looks so, it looks so weak. Yeah. So weak. DJ. Like at least a version without charge minions is playing like evil genius in serpent egg. So when you have those hands where there's victory. nothing, you can at least get on the board and, you know, maybe get an Ethereal Lackey and you get a Plague of Flames and you can have this big swing turn and utilize these unbuffed one drops to uh, at least do something if you don't draw the Imprisoned Scrap in. Um, it seems like the charge version is just all in on the, the one pickup from Scrap Imp. And if you don't have that, well, you're out of luck. No 
scrap him again. Well, no scrap him. No bueno. So we got. So instead, let's play one three. Yeah, and Reese could really use that early game breathing room. Although one thing that I'm looking at right now is uh, how this apotheosis apotheosis will interact with the game. Um, Eddie chooses to go for it aggressively. And Benazado is going to be forced to soul fire, and he can't really develop. And this is really annoying. Zoo Warlock once more will uh, kind of have a setback in their early game development. Okay. It's probably the best discard, to be honest. Oh, yes! A one mana two one. I mean, it's the something. Scarlet Subjugator. <laughs> it's something is better than nothing. Especially a lot of times as the priest, because you don't have a hero power that impacts uh, the board unless you have him. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. I can't help but giggle at how weird and. Pitiful this hand looks right now. Yeah. By giving up charge wins like this with a slow start, you're like giving up opportunity to just keep holding onto cards. Charge minions. Even though like the maximum damage from the deck isn't even incredibly high. Well, okay, it's high. It's really high, but In a single turn, max damage is double Wolf Rider, double Stone Tusk War, and Blue Gill Warrior. Uh, from minions, that's not including like Soul Fire damage, and that's if you get double Scrap Imp on all those charge minions. And that is exactly 30. Oh my gosh. What is happening? It's Handlock. It's Hand Warlock, but with unplayable <laughs> cards. So, even though we've been harping on this deck a lot, Empani's Auto has had some pretty brutal draws. Oh, yeah. You know, let, let's, um, let's call it what it is. Without Scrap Imp, this deck is just really poor, so you just need to draw that card, and he hasn't been drawing it. Even at the bottom of his deck, he hasn't been drawing it. Yeah. He drew it the turn before he died last game, and that was even with the... Uh, he was able to get like an expired merchant and pull in this card on like turn five, but still didn't pick it up. And now he's without a hand of Gul'dan or a scrap imp, and he's almost halfway through his deck, which is very unlikely, especially considering he hard mulligans for both of those cards. Um, so kind of brutal and not super fair to the deck, but stats are stats, Dan. Stats be statin. I must consider. Uh, and, you know, stats is really what Zoo primarily cares about. I mean, stats are primarily the only thing Zoo cares about, except when you factor in the charge damage. Quickly. Must consider. Actually a tough trade. If you don't trade into the Fiendish Servant now, it uh, gives Epanizado the uh, ability to get the buff onto the minion that he wants. Right. Uh, if you do trade into it, it just makes his board more powerful immediately. But I, I think I'd much rather just take the trade, get the power of the board, not let him trade into maybe something more powerful. Um, like he could, I don't know, like isolate a magic carpet and trade into that. You have to time rip it next turn. I don't know. You just get just it out of the way. Oh. Yeah, it's ugly. Nice. Player too. So when this pops, it'll summon a rush minion. Five-five rush minion with no downside. That's 
pretty impressive and Eddie also oh. has uh, the ability to play some really powerful things next two turns. And Bizzato finally picks up Scrap Imp. Does he still have enough time here? <laughs> Bizzato also, like, think about how he wants to approach this board if he's going to just let these minions survive. But he's not really in a position to be pushing damage to the face either. Honestly, probably gonna have to take out the two four. That means the mind flare can't get immediate value off board. It negates a life seal since Eddie's already at thirty. I will act as your Ooh, another shield of Galakron. Eddie's actually almost fully invoked. The time rip will fully invoke the Galakron. Huh. Don't see that too often on a, you know, a fast clock from Priest. But it does give Eddie a little bit of extra insurance in case once the scrap in plops out. Uh, and Panisato tries to go wild on the board. So let's take stock of the actual raw damage numbers here from Panisato. He's running out of just time uh, because he's at 13 because he's tapped so aggressively and there have been minions that have been hitting his face. Bluegill Warriors, eight. Wolf Rider, that's five. Soulfire, it's another four. 17 damage, Dan. So much Empire is out of. Right. From, from hand, given that there's no taunts in the way. Yeah, that's not enough. Nowhere near enough. And take it just a little bit slower, but. What do you what do you think about playing Murda's Hond on curve here, TJ? I honestly, well, okay, that makes sense. The time rip though is more damage over two turns because the Galakron will come down and deal five, and by time ripping you get to push an additional uh, four with the shield of Galakron, so it's nine damage over two turns instead of Murda's which would be able to attack next turn, which would be um, eight damage over two turns effectively. That's just raw efficiency, but the damage breakpoints may not matter. Like, if you time rip now and push seven, if he taps, you have lethal with just a Galakron swing. Um, if you don't time rip now, Galakron only destroys two minions, so if you, like, magic carpets, put a bunch of taunts, you don't get through it easily. Even though it feels weird time ripping a zero four. Seems like it makes sense. You cut his clock so significantly. Alright, this is... <laughs> Burshot can also be used as a lethal <laughs> if you place charge minions. Like, you place buff charge minions, just go, alright, Murr's on. Hit you for two. You're bluegill warrior. There's a second scrap in, but not enough time. He's at ten. Lethal on board, he needs to clear some of it off, which means we got ourselves a good old-fashioned case, a trade rider. Giddy up. I'm the pony up, TJ. <laughs> and then Mursan's lethal, unless he puts a taunt, which he doesn't have a taunt. That is all. Okay, now that's the best part about Wolf Rider Blue Gill Warriors Toto Spore. You can Mursan counter lethal. Oh, it's so funny. Ready to ride. Yep. And if he trades into this mind fire, it just means that he puts a 5-5 five five in play, which yeah. is more damage. You know what we should do, TJ? We should make some uh, uh, Honest Hearthstone cards Grandmaster's Edition. And Wolf Rider, instead of hitting charge, would save Rush. <laughs> in Zoo, honestly, that's what it feels like. Yeah, his Rush mate is pretty great. And he's holding a dragon! That's going to do it for game number four. Eddie takes the series and improves the record to one and one. Empanizado struggles continue. He is now zero and three. Uh, not the great start that he's looking for. Um, however, when you start at zero three, you still 
can still make the playoff seeds. That's the advantage of Division A. It's a very big one. Uh, top mm-hmm. six still has a chance to make it to playoffs or are guaranteed in. And then uh, you have uh, other people who are uh, going to be fighting for the relegation spots. But right now, Empanizada looks like a prime candidate to finish seventh and eighth with a 0 3 start. Uh, needs to really pick it up. Yeah, pretty brutal. Um, honestly, he has brought the charge to both weeks now. And a uh, mix of bad draws, some poor matchups, uh, just kind of all around everything that could go wrong did go wrong in a lot of his zoo games, uh, even you know stretching back to last week. So we'll see. You know, we might have some, uh, well, we do have some uh, meta changes on the horizon, just a matter of time when, and maybe he'll be able to find something there to have success with. But for now, it's back to the drawing board. And uh, Eddie, though, that's a, a much needed win for him because he was one of the one matchers last week. He only had one match on week one. Every player has uh, one week where they only have one match since they have seven to play over four weeks. And it had to feel pretty terrible to come out of the first round Robin playing one match and losing it. But this has to be a step in the right direction for him. Well, uh, this brings 